Today we're going to talk about on-farm cold storage facilities uh, with the uh, local foods movements. Uh, cold storage facilities are, are much more important uh, to keep food fresh and uh, in good quality by the time it gets to market. Um, so we're going to talk about that this morning. And this is part of a Sayer grant, uh, educational and research grant that uh, was awarded to the University of Wisconsin to uh, develop um, um, basically a bulletin on this. Let me just get a pointer here quick. Oh. All right. So today we're going to um, really look at the types of uh, storage facilities. We're going to go over the requirements for refrigeration system and environmental conditions uh, for different um, types of uh, uh, produce that we're going to put in these facilities, and we're going to concentrate on fall harvested uh, because that's typically the, the ones that uh, you're going to store for long periods of time. And the object is here is to move um, uh, sort of like having a uh, high tunnel. We're basically going to try to move the marketing um, to a part of the year when we don't normally grow. Uh, we'll talk about material handling because uh, that's pretty important and something that's often missed. Uh, when people start putting together um, cold storage facilities. Uh, so we're going to talk about containers and logistics and uh, general material handling. Then talk about some planning, uh, a little bit of economics, and then there's some storage grants out there that could help you pay for a new uh, a facility uh, through USDA. So uh, what are some of the crop storage parameters? Well. One is the type of storage will depend on the volumes of crops. Uh, you know, if you're a large potato grower and you're going, you know, hundreds or thousands of acres of potatoes, uh, you need different types of facilities than if you're growing an acre or two. Um, so that can be bulk storage or it can be uh, containers. If we're growing small quantities of stuff, typically makes more sense. The other is how fast am I going to market the product? Is it be really short, you know, up to 60 days, 30 to 60 days, or is it long term, where I'm trying to hold the stuff for three to 12 months? Uh, so that'll make it um, a difference on on how precise I need to be about having optimal conditions um, and the types of uh, facilities I might be able to use. Then there's a crop compatibility. We've got different crops have different temperature requirements, humidity requirements. Uh, some are ethylene producers, some are odor producers, uh, and we have to sometimes keep those separate um, so that they uh, remain marketable. Then the other is investment. We always have financial restraints, so what, uh, how much money can we spend and what can we get? What's the biggest bang for our buck in, in those cases? So I often, uh, when I go out and talk to people, they want a root cellar, <clears throat> and um, you know, because they're, they're typically looking for uh, low energy input. And um, farmers are very adaptable. This is a photo I found on the, the web that uh, somebody used a school bus. Uh, it's probably better as a, a uh, fallout shelter for tornado uh, than, a, um, than a root cellar because of the open roof, but uh, just an example. This is more what uh, people will typically think about a uh, structure that's uh, um, kind of buried in the ground, uh, covered with dirt. Um, so one of the advantages of root cellar is we're using ground temperature to moderate the temperature in the, in the uh, room we're storing it in. And then we can also use outdoor air for cooling as well. Uh, one of the issues is we don't typically have mechanical refrigeration with these. So we're subject to whatever the ambient temperature is. Um, both that will both affect the ground temperature and um, you know the the ambient air temperature we may have for cooling. Um, so you know if you've got uh, if you're in a warm place and it also affects the geography of where, where you're at is whether this will work as well. Um, typically, we just are venting warm air and respiration grasses, um, and typically that is by natural convection because these often don't have any electricity. Now, 
we do use some electricity. It's just fans typically, um, which will require not too much electricity. The other issue is the transfer of heat from the ground is pretty slow. So they're not suitable for moving harvest heat. So if you've got a 70 degree day and you're bringing, or a 90 degree day and you're bringing warm crops in there, they're not going to get cold for several days um, because of the slow heat transfer. The other is accessibility. Um, the picture you have here uh, shows one that's, uh, you know, you can't wheel a cart into this thing. Um, and here's another one that's even worse, uh, where you have to hand carry stuff in and out. If you have to do that and you and it's more than a hobby, um, you're not going to be cost effective because you're going to have too much labor uh, involved in this. Uh, so if we're going to do something, we need to be more labor efficient. This is what I'd call a modern root cellar concept. Um, this is an earth contact basement. Um, and I'll explain because we've got two stories on this, and uh, there's a reason why we have a second story. It's it's actually a very inexpensive uh, space when you get right down to it. Um, so here, this this one happens to be in in um, northern Minnesota, uh, around the uh, uh, Duluth, Minnesota area, uh, where we've got the average ground temperature of about 49 degrees. Uh, so that's perfect for potatoes and stuff. A uh, little warm for some of our other root crops, um, but uh, it's close. So the question is, why why is this not all in the ground? Well, one is the cost of roof. If I put a uh, a roof on a, a structure, so if I make it um, more like uh, this structure here, and uh, and in today's I'd have to use a con put a concrete roof on there. Well, to support that roof is very expensive. That's that's an ex more more expensive than a typical truss framed uh, roof section. So if we put that on, it's going to be um, very inex less expensive roof to put on. Well, if we're going to do that, um, you know, four walls, and we can have some extra storage space, whether that's an office, that's um, um, employee ho room or housing or whatever. And then we insulate the, the ceiling between the uh, cellar and the uh, second floor um, very well to uh, keep the cold in the basement and keep the warm in the, in the upper portion. Um, so it has to do with financial costs is one of the reasons we're, we're going to look at that. This because you've got a, uh, a door at ground level, we have accessibility to fork trucks. So root crops are very heavy. Uh, and we're most likely going to be handling them in pallet boxes. And so um, having a place where we can just drive that fork truck in is going to save us a lot of labor. Um, now, how do, they, how do they keep that co this cold uh, versus freezing? Now, one of the things uh, down here, we've got the illustration of the wall section. Um, so uh, here's my floor down here and my walls, and what they did is they mounted the dirt up, so the dirt's mounted up here, and then we've buried, well actually the mount, dirt's mounted up over here. Um, we came down the side walls, actually it's the whole side wall is insulated down below grade, and then we've got a piece of foam that runs eight inches away from the wall, basically to keep the frost from coming in next to the wall. Um, if you bring that frost in, next to the wall, you can easily get down to, you know, about 32 degrees. Um, but for some of our crops, we don't want that. Uh, they will spoil in that case. So this, this is crudely uh, how this um, facility is laid out. They've got a, a staging area. They've got a room here where they do carrots. They've got an enclosed room where they do uh, a squash, and that one's actually heated slightly. And then we have in the back we have um, bulk bins where they do uh, potatoes. Um, bulk bins are probably not the best choice uh, for this this uh, operator because he's having to load these by hand. But that was his choice at the time. Since then, he's moved to um, pallet bins. 
Uh, but that just gives you an example of how you do it. Now, this facility is actually used outside air for cooling as well. So they've got a duct system through the place with a motor-controlled uh, dampers. Uh, there's a computer that looks at the outside temperature and the inside temperature and decides when it's uh, beneficial to bring in some outside air uh, for cooling. And uh, this is a this graph down here shows uh, the outside temperature is the, the blue here and shows the temperature of the different rooms. So we've got the squash on top, which is um, in yellow. And then we've got the uh, potatoes and the carrots. Um, one of the things I want to point out here is in the squash room, they actually have a heater on the wall. Um, if you get squash too, too cold, it's going to spoil. So we've got a heater, and we've got an overhead fan. And when that heater runs, the fan needs to run, uh, basically just to mix that or, or make that heat that's coming into the room more uniform because we don't want spikes where it goes high and then low. We want it to be very uniform. Um, but you can see despite the, the cold temperatures here, down to minus uh, 10 degrees in some cases, um, and sometimes not getting much above zero, uh, this room maintained a very even temperature. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if you want to see more about this, uh, here's a website where you can go uh, to get some more information about this facility. Well, what are some of the other uh, types of uh, storage we can use? One is refrigerators. Now, if you've got small quantities of stuff, I used to grow fresh market asparagus. I used a refrigerator to hold stuff. It was typically just overnight or maybe a couple days, uh, but they're nice because they're self-contained. The biggest disadvantage is that there's no humidity control. Uh, so for long-term storage, uh, they're not beneficial that way. And there's no air exchange. So if you're storing something like apples, uh, you're going to get an ethylene buildup in that uh, refrigerator. Um, so it's going to actually increase the spoilage of the ripening of that uh, crop uh, versus if we had some air exchange. Um, the other issue is to make sure that this, the space efficiency, whatever I'm using for containers, um, where it fits the shelves. Because you put something in, maybe you're using containers so you can handle it in bulk, but then uh, you've got 40% um, you know, wasted space. Uh, then that's maybe not uh, very efficient. The other is solid doors are going to be more efficient than glass because of uh, heat loss. And then uh, refrigerators, they have a limited capacity to remove field heat. They're basically made to, you know, a few items at a time are put into their warm and they can cool those down. But if I put 100 pounds of, uh, say, asparagus in a refrigerator, it's not going to get down to the uh, desired temperature overnight. And that refrigerator is going to run um, continuously. And um, it could have a chance of freezing it because of the way the refrigerator works. Uh, a commercial refrigerator is going to be better than, than um, uh, a residential one, mainly because of the commercial one is going to have an air, a fan in there to move air around, whereas the um, Residential one, typically when the refrigeration is not running, the fan's not running. Um, so just it's a, um, whether you get cold spots or not. The other thing is a residential one uses the freezer basically as the, the cooler and then pulls air out of, the, out of the freezer to cool the refrigerator. Um, so you've got some limitations that way as well. The workhorse of the industry is either drive-in or walk-in cooler. Um, you know, if you're doing any kind of quantity, um, this is going to be your best bet. <clears throat> and the rule of thumb for these on a planning stage is about two and a half to three cubic foot um, per bushel of produce you're going to put in there. So you're going to get about 50% utilization of your your cooling space. Now these come in either modular or you can build them in place, and we'll go through both here. And some of the features are uh, they should have a lockable door so you can uh, have some control over that produce. They need to be washable interiors. They should have a floor drain, uh, well-insulated walls to keep your, your energy costs down, 
Uh, temperature control, insulated floors are optimal, and a self-closing door so that when you go in, walk in with a hand load of stuff, the door closes behind you because one of our biggest, uh, uh, well, the, the, the heat loss from air moving in and out of the cooler because of door openings can be very significant. Um, so keeping the door closed can help in that regard. So if we're doing a, a modular cooler or manufactured out of manufactured panels, we have um, lots of <clears throat> choices here. So they, uh, they, these panels will come in two to twelve inch thicknesses, um, walls and roofs, uh, etc. Uh, they build whole buildings out of these panels these days. Uh, so they'll, if it's a large building, it'll have a steel frame, and then these are the the um, the uh, shell around it. Um, they have a, a closed cell foam center, and uh, steel or plastic or aluminum uh, interior and exterior uh, for protection of the foam and to make a cleanable surface. Um, Ideally, you need to have a minimum of four inches, four to five inches. Uh, the requirement is uh, energy code requires an R25 in all new uh, <coughs> coolers. Um, but um, six inches is, is uh, much better. You could get uh, more energy savings. Now, the foam in these is either urethane or polystyrene. Uh, and, and the foam basically acts as a vapor barrier. Now, one advantage of these, these are really easy to set up. A small cooler can be set up and running in an hour uh, from scratch. Um, and ba basically, these panels, they're, they're tongue and groove on the end, so they fit together. And then they have a uh, locking mechanism that holds the panels together. Uh, so you just you have a little tool you put in there, and it, it pulls the thing together, and it locks the, the uh, um, the walls to the floor, if you're using a, a prefab floor or the ceiling. Uh, sometimes the ceilings are bolted down, but either way. So all I got to do is caulk the seams and uh, throw this together, and I'm going to have a cooler on. On a, You need a, um, well, if you don't use a prefab floor, you, have, you need a concrete pad to put them on. Um, if we're doing a built-in cooler, uh, we can do that as well. Um, again, R25 walls, that's the right recommended, but R30 would be uh, highly recommended. If we're doing a built-in, fiberglass insulation is a no-no. Um, fiberglass insulation will get wet. I would and we will get any water vapor that gets into that wall uh, will condense in the uh, insulation. And if it's um, fiberglass, uh, it tends to let a lot of air movement through there, much more than foam, and we will get condensation. So this is an example. Um, you know, we've got an interior. Well, this is showing interior surface is warm. In some cases, in the summer, we've got an interior surface that's um, uh, hot, or exterior surface that's warm, and the interior surface is is cold. So uh, we're going to like, likely get some kind of uh, uh, condensation in that wall. With foam, um, it's much better vapor barrier. It doesn't let water in there. And if it does and, and gets a little damp, it's um, not going to deteriorate over time because of a small amount of water that gets in there. <clears throat> um, insulated floor is highly recommended, one to two inches under the floor. And it should be a 25 to 40 PSI rating. Uh, most uh, foam that's used in the walls of buildings is 15 PSI rating. Uh, so you need to look for a better quality foam for those. Uh, basically, you have concrete on them, and you're going to run over it with, say, a fork truck. Um, and that's going to be a higher PSI rating on that floor surface. So if we use a, a, a foam and we put too much, say we use the 15 PSI foam, and we put too much load on it, it will crush and, and eventually let the, the, the floor will um, will probably crack eventually. Uh, the interior surface of the walls should be washable. That's a that's a food re, um, food code requirement. Uh, so typically we're going to use either a 
uh, fiber reinforced plastic, stainless steel or steel or aluminum uh, are some of the choices. Uh, we need uh, drain for condensation. That also helps wash up. Uh, if we get prefab pour, it may not have a drain, uh, but somehow we need to take a, uh, any condensation from the uh, refrigeration system we need to be able to handle. And when we look at the cost of um, a built-in cooler versus a prefab cooler, there often isn't a lot of difference. So um, the cost uh, for using a, a used cooler panels with a refrigeration system, a 12 by 12 by 8 is about $5,500. Uh, that was a price I got recently. And um, that's about what it's going to cost you to build one. If you build one from scratch, you're going to have about oh, $25,000 to $3,000 in materials, uh, plus a refrigeration system, uh, which depending on what you use, to match this one, you'd have to spend about $3,000 uh, to, to get the same refrigeration capacity. Uh, so you're, you're right in about the same uh, amount of money. So if you go with prefab, it's going to be up in a day, and it has resale value. So that's one of the advantages. So a little bit about insulation. Just uh, there's different kinds of insulation. It's uh, foam insulation. Uh, we've got urethane foam, which is it tends to be yellow, and usually is what we use for spray in uh, spray in foam or foam in place. Um, we have polyethylene um, or polystyrene, ex extruded polystyrene. It could be uh, uh, pink, blue, sometimes gray. Uh, expanded polystyrene, or sometimes called beadboard, is white. Um, it is not water. Uh, it will allow water to go through it, so that's not recommended. And then um, uh, polyisocyanate. Um, it's usually off-white. And it's a higher R value to begin with. Uh, but when we look at the aged, uh, aged insulation values, all these tend to come in about 5. Uh, extru extruded polystyrene is very uh, good at water, resisting water uh, from coming in it. So when we get it all done at the end of the day, if you use an R value of 5 in your calculations, um, you know, once you get past that first year, that's about what that facility is going to, to uh, provide for an R value. Um, uh, the, the foam board insulation often comes in a tongue groove, so that's an advantage uh, from sealing out uh, air movement through the wall. And we, rec we recommend that all seams be taped. If you're putting a double layer of foam, say you're trying to get to that four inches of foam, so you use two um, two two-inch layers, the recommendation is to offset the seams on that so we don't have uh, seams directly on top of each other. Um, if we're doing, um, um, we can do foam in place. Um, so the advantage of that is all, all the edges are sealed. If we're using uh, a foam board in a cavity, uh, we may want to come in with some spray foam uh, to get all the edges so that we, we seal the edges uh, between, say, the studs and the foam. Um, and one of the issues is foam is uh, very flammable. So we need to protect it from heat sources. Now you're saying, well, you've got a cooler. You sh shouldn't expect any heat sources. It's still required from an uh, insurance basis that it be covered uh, to protect it from any ignition sources. Um, so having that uh, plastic board or, or steel panel over top of it um, will help protect that from uh, ignition sources. And then uh, if we're doing a, um, something, we should have uh, the outside covered basically for rodent proofing as much as anything. And here's uh, roughly what the, you know, if you, as you increase the amount of insulation, what the R value is going to be. So R value is, is uh, basically resistance to heat flow. Uh, so as we get higher, we resist uh, the amount of heat flow. Uh, they're all self self-contained units, so a truck, uh, trailer, reefer. Um, we see some of these uh, retired uh, truck bodies used for um, uh, coolers in some cases. Um, the biggest disadvantage is they only have you know 
two to three inches of foam in the in the wall. If it's a retired truck body, uh, there's a reason they got rid of it, and it's probably not the the, the foam may be um, not in very good condition in some cases. Um, you may sometimes these things will get cracks around the top here and let water in, uh, so that'll reduce the effectiveness of the foam as far as insulation. So you're going to have higher heat loss or heat gain with these things. The other thing is if you buy them with refrigeration, the refrigeration system that comes with these is basically to maintain the temperature of the product. It's expecting that you're putting cold product into this thing and it's going to maintain it uh, for transport. So, you know, you're going to put, um, uh, you know, 5,000 pounds of carrots in it at 32 degrees. And when it gets to the other end and you take it out, it may have warmed to 34, um, but it's still going to be cold. So that's that's the object of that kind of refrigeration system. The other is that uh, airflow may not be ideal just because of the, uh, uh, the shape of the structure and the, uh, the placement of this refrigeration system. Um, and then the other issue is accessibility for material handling. If you've got, uh, this was on a farm I went to visit, so you can't just drive into this because you've got a distance here between the ground and the, and the, the um, platform of the truck body. So what they were having to do is put a, um, a pallet jack on the truck body. They bring and set their pallet of material on here with a fork truck, and then they'd have to move it into the truck. Uh, so you've got extra labor in doing that um, that if this was, if you're going to use one of these, set it up so you can just drive in. Uh, that'll save you labor. Um, now, where one of these things is good is if you're going to farmer's market. You know, here's a trailer system. Uh, you can put your cold stuff in there. You run it to farmer's market, and you can pull it out as you need it so it stays in perfect condition and you have no deterioration uh, over there. So if you don't sell everything, um, you can take that back sell it someplace else. Um, so here's an example of the refrigeration system that we have in most uh, cold storage facilities. Um, you go start up here. This is the one you'd see inside the cooler. This is a, a evaporator unit. It usually has fans in it. It's going to have a, a heat exchanger. And basically, the air is going to come through there. It's going to cool. As it's being cooled, it's actually going to dehumidify the air as well and uh, put that air into the cooler. Um, so that's this portion here. Uh, when the, the refrigeration comes out of that, um, it is a, a, uh, a high pressure um, vapor. Uh, so it's coming in coming into here as a liquid. It uh, comes out as a vapor. Uh, it's actually a low pressure vapor, I'm sorry. Uh, low pressure vapor, it's going to come down. Um, and then it's going to go through a compressor where we're going to increase the pressure um, so that pressure can come out. And typical system, we're going to come out and it's going to go through an air-cooled condenser, which will be outside the cold storage, and we're going to reject the heat to, to the air. And then, then it's going to loop back around and start to thing. So it's going to be a liquid after it comes out of the condenser, and it's going to loop back around and re restart. If I have a lot of summertime cooling, and washing requirements, I might want to put in what we call a, a heat re refrigeration heat recovery unit to reclaim some of that heat. Uh, so the advantage of that is I have basically free warm water uh, for washing. Uh, so that can be uh, uh, an advantage. So if we're buying a system, there's a number of different types of refrigerant that are used out there. So the, most of the new systems are going to have R404A, um, that's that's what's coming out. The um, uh, older systems, um, R12, that's been uh, banned as of uh, the first of, of this year. It's been restricted sales uh, for many years now, but it's basically banned. Um, R22 is also on the list. Um, it's banned for new use in equipment as of 2010 and it will cease production in 2020. So the only place you're using that now is for existing 
refrigeration systems. And this has to do with these, these um, refrigerants, uh, if they leak out into the environment, will um, uh, cause o reduction of ozone that protects our environment. Um, the other uh, uh, refrigerants out there are R134A, and um, that has restricted sales, but it's still available. Um, now, if you've got a refrigeration system and you need to uh, uh, do anything to it, um, you are, it's, it's illegal to intentionally release, re release any refrigerant into the system. Uh, if you, you need to service a system or change a system, you need to bring in a refrigeration technician to recapture that, that refrigerant um, uh, out of the system so it doesn't leak into the environment. Um, one of the things if we're buying a new system, uh, we might want to look at the fan motors that are used in the evaporators. Uh, these typically will run all the time uh, to promote air mixing. And the uh, typical um, uh, system is going to use what we call a permanent split capacitor motor. Uh, it's an old style motor. They're about 50 to 60 percent efficient. The newer style is um, called electric, electrically connotated um, motor. And uh, they're 65 to 80 percent efficient, so much more efficient. Uh, still give you the same same results. Uh, so on new systems, uh, the EC motors are recommended over the permanent split capacitor uh, motors. The other thing uh, we can do is to uh, use a fan control if we don't think we need air mixing all the time. We shut that fan off. Um, when the fan's running, you're producing electricity and you're putting heat into the um, cold storage. Any any uh, energy that's going to that motor is going to end up as heat in the cold storage, so that adds to our heat load. So if we can don't need the fan and we turn it off, uh, that's going to save us both energy and uh, from the fan standpoint and the cooling standpoint. Uh, so that can be an advantage. Uh, refrigeration sizing, uh, we need to look at several factors when we're looking at sizing. The biggest load is going to be uh, field heat. So when we bring a product in, say it's 80 degrees and we need to cool it down to 50 degrees, uh, we've got 30 degrees of, of temperature to remove out of there. Uh, typical um, uh, produce has a specific heat content of about uh, 0.9 BTUs per pound uh, per degree Fahrenheit. Um, so you're going to have to remove um, about 27 BTUs out of that, per pound out of that product to get it from 80 to, to 50 um, uh, degrees. Um, the, one of the problems with the field heat is it only happens at harvest. So we're sizing the system just for for that uh, day or two or a week or two at harvest. Um, but it's the largest load. Uh, the, the next is, is a heat of respiration. Uh, produce, just because it's picked, it's still very alive. Uh, the cells are, are, um, are um, using sugars and stuff and creating uh, CO2 and water. And um, so we need to, and sometimes ethylene. So we need to uh, remove that heat that those those uh, that produce is, is uh, creating to keep it at the desired temperature. Then we have conduction heat loss. This is through the structure, so through the wall, ceilings, floor. Um, so that's that's an easy one, an obvious one, and that can be heat loss or heat gain. So we have heat gain during the summer. If we're storing something at 50 and it's minus 20 out, uh, it's heat loss. Uh, so in some cases, we may have to heat the inside of the cooler to maintain a temperature, even if it's you know 32 or or uh, 50 degrees. Um, so, uh, then we have infiltration heat loss. So this is uh, typically from opening doors. Uh, so it depends how often we're walking in and out of that cooler on a day or an hour as to what it is. 
Uh, leaks can also be an issue uh, through the seams and, and around the door seals and stuff, although air exchange from opening the door is much bigger uh, than, than any of the seams unless the uh, facility is poorly constructed. And then we have equipment heat gain. So this is lights, fans as I alluded to previously, fork trucks, people, anything that spends time in that, in that um, cooler that, that's higher than the uh, set point of temperature. So here's an illustration of, of the field heat being the biggest component. So this is for an apple storage, 15,000 bushel apple storage. And you can see it depends on how many days we take to load this as to what that field heat requirement from a refrigeration standpoint is. But you can see we need somewhere between, uh, say, 13 and a half to 16 tons of, of um, refrigeration capacity versus otherwise we'd need maybe two and a half to three. Um, if we if we could cool it down to um, the temperature of the cooler before we put it in, so uh, it's short duration, but it's very important um, for fall harvested crops. Could be much smaller um, because we're bringing them in at say 40 degrees instead of you know 70 or 80 degrees, um, but it still can be an effect. It still has to be looked at when we're we're figuring out our, our refrigeration capacity. Um, factors for removal of, of field heat depends on the and how fast it happens. Depends on the type of packaging or container we're using. So if we have solid sides, we're not going to get as good air exchange um, through that uh, in between the produce uh, to get the good air exchange. Uh, if we have airflow, we're going to get much better air exchange if, than if we have, if we have static uh, air movement. Um, if we have a, a bins with slotted um, sides or bottom, we're going to have much better air or much faster heat exchange than if we have solid sides and bottoms. Um, the other is going to be if we have low refrigeration capacity. We don't have the ability to remove the heat, the heat from the cooler. Uh, that, can, that can make it take longer. And then airflow. Airflow is critical in removing field heat. Um, in fact, some places they they will set up one cooler um, with a fan system in it just to get that uh, field heat removed fast. So if we don't remove it fast enough, uh, we can end up with wilting. So something like greens will wilt. Uh, we can have, um, you know, ripening uh, can result in spoilage if you've got a very sensitive crop. And it'll definitely shorten shelf life. Uh, so getting, depending on the crop, getting them down to uh, the optimal temperature uh, as fast as possible is usually important. Now, things like potatoes that have to cure uh, is, is a little different. So one of the thing, ways we can uh, avoid um, having to size our, our refrigeration quite so big is to do some kind of pre-cooling. So that can be a water bath or hydro-cooling. Um, so things like carrots uh, or uh, beets can be hydro-cooled. Um, one of the disadvantages of hybrid cooling uh, is that we can spread disease through the water that way. Um, so that's something we need to uh, take into account. We can do forced air cooling. So things like strawberries, uh, we, we do forced air cooling. And this is, uh, we've got a couple examples of forced air cooling. So this is something where you, you put it into a cooler, you stack these up, you just put a pan in front of it, and you're basically just pulling the air that's in the cooler through the product faster than it would otherwise. Uh, another way to do it is uh, with a plenum wall. So we've got this wall in here. The cooling unit's behind us. We're going to bring um, air um, through the product, through this hole, up behind the wall, and out through the, the uh, uh, fans here. Uh, so trying to bring product the air through this product now sometimes the fans are are actually incorporated back in the wall versus here but you're going to basically pull the pull the air through the product uh, and back out again uh, the other some things we can do ice packs so things like broccoli uh, we can do it's traditionally ice packed uh, for cooling 
And then when we have large quantities out in California, they often will have vacuum cooling, which basically we draw a vacuum on, on a product. Um, uh, air will evaporate, water will evaporate faster and provide some additional advantages for cooling. Uh, so that's, that's another um, avenue. Typically, that's a large, very large commercial operation that can afford that kind of equipment. Uh, respiration rates are temperature dependent. Uh, so this is a chart of uh, some typical crops grown in the upper Midwest. So you can see as we move down in temperature, um, the, uh, the respiration rates change. And they dramatically change in some cases. Um, um, dramatically change on, on temperature. So you've got to find the sweet spot for whatever that product is um, through. And then some products you can't go as cold. So things like um, peppers and tomatoes. Uh, if you go too cold, you'll get what we call chilling. Um, uh, so they can spoil faster. So sweet potatoes and regular potatoes are examples of, of some that uh, require uh, higher temperatures. Uh, squash is another one. A winter squash um, would be another one that uh, uh, requires higher temperatures, but they'll store very well. So winter squash will store very well at 50 degrees and uh, 60 to 70 percent relative humidity. Um, so refrigeration sizing, we want to look at the, the worst case scenarios for all these. So to get the, the maximum cooling, uh, design cooling, we need to take into account field heat, respiration heat, conduction heat, infiltration, and equipment um, heat loads. And then we add all those up, and then we're going to put a, a service factor in there. Um, basically, the service factor is we know that the uh, refrigeration system, as it ages, will reduce in capacity. And then if we're operating a system um, anywhere close to, uh, say, under 38, 38 degrees and under, we can get the frost buildup on the um, evaporator. Uh, so we need to put uh, some a factor in there uh, to allow the fact that we're going to have to uh, uh, put some heat in that on that uh, evaporator to melt the frost off, so it will continue being efficient at cooling. Um, We'll often hear refrigeration referred to as a ton of refrigeration. And this is basically based on melting a ton of ice over 24 hours. Uh, so that equals uh, uh, the energy that would be in melting of ice is uh, 288,000 BTUs, or it's about 12,000 BTUs per hour uh, is the uh, what a ton of refrigeration would equal. Um, here's a, I ad adapted um, looking at different size uh, coolers, um, and this has lots of assumptions which you, we've we've got down here. But just to give you an idea of what the cooling loads would be for um, some sample size of coolers, and you notice I've got typical load uh, versus heavy load here, and the uh, difference is basically. Um, uh, one, the air exchange rate, and how many pounds of produce I'm putting in per cubic foot of cooler. So uh, typical would be two pounds per cubic foot uh, per day uh, versus three pounds per cubic foot per day. Um, so as we're putting more in, we've got more field heat to take out. So that increases the load. And then it'll be also affected by what our final cooling temperature is. Uh, so this is just to give you an example. You really have to do the calculations for your equipment uh, and your conditions um, to get a, a, a more definitive number. But this will at least give you uh, some ideas of that. And uh, there's a publication coming out that it's spelled out step by step of, of how to do this. Uh, now let's talk a little about, about the refrigeration equipment. Uh, many people with small systems, um, uh, especially starting out, they don't want to spend a lot of money. And um, 
There's a system out there called CoolBot Controller. Uh, it basically uh, allows you to take a window air conditioning and override the controls so that it can be uh, uh, run at cooler temperatures. Um, window uh, air conditioner is basically made to run at you know 70 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but we now want to run them at uh, um, you know 35 or 40 um, uh, Fahrenheit. So the the controllers on those don't let you turn that down that far. So they've developed this, there's a farmer that developed this controller to uh, basically make the thing run uh, even though it wasn't designed to do that. Now these are going to um, have much less uh, cooling capacity uh, at lower temperatures than their rated uh, temperatures. So you buy one and it says it's 18,000 BTUs per hour. Well, that's for air, room air conditioning at 70 degrees. At 35 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, it's going to be much less than uh, cooling than that. Uh, so that manufacturer has some recommendations for the size of cooler, and he also has recommendations for some brands because some brands don't work in cold weather, um, and some brands don't work as well um, by using the Silveride controller. So. He's made some recommendations on that um, as to how how to do that. Now, if you've got large cooling loads, you may need multiple units in order to get the same benefit as you would with a commercial unit. And the big draw here is the fact that you don't have to hire a refrigeration technician to come in, and the equipment's lower. So you could have about a thousand bucks, roughly tied up between the, buying a new air conditioning unit and um, a controller. Uh, versus maybe two to three thousand dollars for a, a basically a commercial duty unit. Um, so that's one example. <clears throat> this is an example of a small self-contained unit um, that is commercial duty. Uh, it's basically an all-in-one unit, so it's kind of like plug-and-play. There's no no technician required. Uh, you cut a hole through the cooler, so this they actually cut a hole through the back of the cooler. This part of the air conditioning unit is pushed through there. They uh, backfill it. There's a panel you backfill back in here. Um, this is what it's going to look like on the outside. And uh, you've got air conditioning. Uh, so your condensing unit is on the outside here, and your evaporator unit is on the inside. So the air is going to um, come up through the back side here, um, through the, the um, unit, and back into the room. Um, so one of the advantages I see of these units is there are one much higher capacity and a known capacity. Uh, they are rated at say 40 degrees that's going to have XY capacity because these are designed to work at those temperatures. Uh, they have a circulating fan which will run all the time which will promote faster cooling with the air conditioning unit when the air conditioner is off the fan doesn't run. Um, they can be uh, rooftop or side mounted. Um, so this one, you got side mounted. One disadvantage is it sticks into the room, so that's a place where I can't put um, product. Although it does provide a very nice circulation that it's up the back wall and across the the top of the product. Uh, they can be inside or outside. So they have waterproof or weatherproof ones that can be outside. And the cost range, I think these are. Um, I think from a half horse to about two horses, um, so they're they're going to be sixteen hundred to thirty eight hundred dollars. Uh, when we last checked, um, the cost of one of these things. Uh, so that's advantage is that it's much more durable, heavy duty. It's going to last for years. <clears throat> so let's move down to what uh, we need to know for for temperatures. So different crops are going to have different temperature ranges. And we have basically four categories plus other, or maybe three categories plus other. Um, so first we have cool and very humid. So right, ab right at or just above freezing and 90 to 95 to 100% relative humidity. Uh, we, don't want, we don't want surface to be wet, 
So we don't want condensing, but we want it to be high humidity. So these would be beets, cabbage, carrots, parsnips, uh, celerac, and there's a few others. <clears throat> um, then the next is basically cold and a little less humid, so 90 to 95%. So these are apples, pears, turnips, Jerusalem artichokes would be some examples. There's a few others. Then we have cool and dry. These are basically onion family. So 32 degrees, so just above freezing, freezing, and 65 to 70 percent relative humidity. So onion, garlic, shallots um, would be some examples. And then we have, I'll call them specialty crops. Or not specialty crops, but crops that have their own requirements. So potatoes. Potatoes can be anywhere from 40 to 50 degrees, depending on what their end use is, and 95 to 99 percent humidity. Um, you have winter squash, 50, 55, 50 to 70 percent relative humidity. Sweet potatoes, just a little warmer, uh, 65, there's 55 to 60, um, but a little higher humidity, uh, 80 to 85. So those are some examples of different crops and stuff. So here's the other thing is di different crops, depending on you know where they're stored at have different lengths of time that they'll last. Uh, so basically what the marketing period is. And that's one of the things that I often see is that um, people complain about high, high spoilage out of storage, but it's because they didn't market the product within a reasonable time from what the expectation of that product would last. Um, so things like apples. If we just have an air storage, uh, it's two to four months, we have a controlled atmospheric storage, which is where we change the composition of the gas mixture inside the storage, uh, we can keep them up to a year in some varieties. Um, so this goes through the different types um, of products and what the uh, length of storage would be. Um, so one of the things that one of the ones that I commonly hear is, you know, the winter squash didn't last. Well, the marketing period roughly is two to three months. Um, I, you know, I've occasionally I've had ones that lasted longer, um, but the, that's because probably it was really optimal conditions and, a, and the product out of the field was in really good condition um, so that they lasted longer. But typically they won't last but two to three months. And there is some variation between varieties of, of uh, squash. So things, things like a, Delicati doesn't last as long as, say, uh, a butternut squash or Hubbard squash. Uh, the other issues we have with products uh, is um, ethylene. So ethylene can cause problems. Um, uh, if we don't have the right, right um, um, humidity for stuff or it gets too cold uh, or we have um, Products that have uh, um, odors that that they'll put off, give off odors that others will absorb. So, example would be apples and and pears should really be stored by themselves um, because they're ethylene producers and they will affect uh, other crops. And then things like onions shouldn't be stored with anything else because they'll impart impart odors onto uh, other things that they're stored with. Um, so here's an example of celery being stored with onions or carrots um, uh, can have an effect. <clears throat> um, one thing I'll point out is meat should never be stored with any produce and basically that's a food safety issue as much as anything. Um, so these are just some of the examples um, uh, that you'll find. Uh, as far as compatibility. Humidity control. Humidity control is one of the biggest things that um, farmers can do or growers can do to improve the length of time that a product will, will uh, um, last in storage. When you're selling a crop, you're selling water. And if the, the product becomes dehydrated because of water loss, you're losing sales. And on top of that, you're probably losing quality. You know, in the old days, we had root cellars, and I know I have a root cellar. 
and you know my potatoes in uh, in in April or May are shriveled, shriveled surfaces. Today's consumer won't. I mean, they're still edible, but today's consumer won't buy those. Um, so we need to keep things um, in the proper conditions so that they're um, saleable longer or marketable longer. Um, so moisture is one of the big things to do that. So we need to add moisture. One of the things is when we're using mechanical cooling, uh, mechanical refrigeration, um, that's going to dehumidify the air. So we basically have to continuously put moisture back in the air uh, to maintain the moisture. And we're going to talk a little more about um, sizing of the evaporators, I believe, in, uh, in this that, that affects the moisture control. So there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, one is evaporative cooling pads. These are typically used in bulk storage facilities. Um, so here's an example over here. So the air is coming through. It goes through a pad. On the pad, you're dripping water down through this. Um, the water, as the air comes through it, the warmer air will evaporate some of the water. In the process of evaporation, it cools the air. So we're going to get high moisture, higher moisture in the air and cooling of it as well. So these are typically used when we have a, either plenum wall in a, a cooler or a, a bulk storage where we, we have an airflow coming under the product, up through the product, and, and recirculating. Kind of the workhorse of the industry is what we call a centrifugal atomizer. And uh, these can be uh, either fixed or variable rate. So I've got some pictures up here. So this is a fixed one here. Um, uh, this, is, this would work fine in a, ver a small cooler, so maybe up to a, a 12 by 12, or maybe a little larger. Uh, has a capacity of, well, a varying capacity from about a half to one gallon uh, per hour that they'll add water in. And basically, it has a disc that spins, and you, um, the water is thrown out through the disc through either little holes or blades that uh, atomize the, the water into a fine mist. And then that comes out into the, the air. Um, this one here is another example of a, a commercial unit uh, atomizer, and uh, here here's another one. This this uh, one down here. This these have a, uh, um, rates up to 24 to 36 gallons per hour. So these would be for a very large cooler, um, but they are variable, so you can um, control them. Um, the blue one here. This is uh, basically a home humidifier, but it could be used in a small cooler. It's an ultrasonic, it uses ultrasonic uh, pulses to atomize the water. Uh, so just another technology, so instead of mechanically throwing the water, um, it's doing it a little different. It's using vibration uh, to atomize that water. The other thing we can do, especially if we have, um, say we're trying to, we only have one cooler and we're trying to do some different things in the cooler once, we can create microclimates. So one way we can do that is we can pack things in a plastic bag. So there's some growers that will um, um, put, for instance, carrots in a, pla in a pallet box uh, with a plastic bag in the box, or they'll cover the pallet box with a plastic bag to help hold the moisture in um, to create a microclimate. Um, so there are some disadvantages doing that. You don't want to do it with a high ethylene producing crop because that will increase spoilage. But something like carrots um, have very low ethylene production, so it's not an issue. Uh, the other issue is before you bag them like this, they need to be very close to the temperature of the cooler because the heat will be transferred not by um, convection, which you'd be doing uh, if it wasn't in the bag, but now Everything in the bag, the heat's got to be conducted by conduction through the bag. Uh, so it needs to be very close to the storage temperature when we put it in the bag. The other thing we could do is use, uh, in the old days, we used to use you know, damp sand or sawdust to store stuff in. Uh, that's labor intensive to do that. So for a hobbyist, it might work. But for commercial people, it's, it's not practical. We need some kind of control for humidity. 
we don't want to just turn the humidifier on and let it run because if we get too high that's not going to work for some products um, and if it gets too low we want to make sure we get turned on now especially for uh, products that uh, you know apples or, or um, beets or carrots they require a very high humidities so we want a, a humidifying a humidistat that's got a range up to 99 percent there's a lot of them on the market that'll go uh, 80 or 90 percent um, but you got to remember that as you get close to the end of the range uh, the accuracy decreases um, so we want to have a full range if we can if we can do that um, so the other thing we want to do is look for accuracy so this is how um, you know if I um, say I go down reducing my humidity if I come back up I want to know how often is it repeatable to the same uh, space based on my setting so we want that to be within three to four percent humidity is a little tough to measure um, so it's not going to be real precise but three to four percent um, will give you a controller that's not real costly um, but does the job the other is the resolution of the controller so how uh, what's how how can it measure to know when it wants to come on and, and turn off um, so typically, one percent is good enough. A lot of the controllers are at least a tenth of a percent or two tenths of a percent. So that's basically the smallest uh, digit in the display. Um, having a remote sensor is desirable. Uh, one because that allows me to put the sensor in the airflow, where I can detect uh, what the real um, um, moisture content of the air that the product's going to see, uh, and it may allow me to put my controller which is, has electronics in it in a, a spot that's that's um, drier where it may last longer so there's a range in cost of these depending on how sophisticated so 140 to 500 dollars um, roughly depending on uh, the type of controller and and uh, how accurate it is as the accuracy goes up the cost of course goes up as well humidity control with refrigeration systems, um, the evaporator um, needs to have large surface area. If you go out and buy a, a used cooler that used to be store beer, you're not going to have very good luck with that for storing um, uh, produce because the evaporator is not going to. You're going to have too high a temperature drop across the evaporator, and you'll get uh, lots of dehumidification on every cycle. So what this tries to, this table tries to show you is that we'd really like to be able to hear about a one degree temperature drop across the evaporator. We'll maintain um, about a 95 percent relative humidity in that cooler. If I go down to uh, two degrees temperature drop of, uh, across that cooler, I'm down to, to uh, you know, between 99 or about seven degrees temperature differential across the cooler. So they're going to be under 80 percent uh, relative humidity. Um, so you're going to get desiccation of your product um, if you have that kind of cool refrigeration system in your cooler. Um, so it's important to size it. If you, you go to buy a new unit and the refriger refrigeration um, dealer you're dealing with doesn't understand go find a new one you need to find somebody that's worked with vegetable growers that understands this and the self-contained units that I showed you a little while ago they're probably in the beer cooler range as far as uh, temperature drop up across that cooler because they're you know if you're, you're storing um, say a, a meat locker or or a, um, or butcher shop or or a beer cooler whatever you don't need high humidity in that cooler so that's an important distinction um, if you're buying a used system especially or new make sure you have a evaporator that's going to have one degree one to two degree temperature drop across that evaporator or you're not going to be successful um, one thing we always look for uh, is to reduce our energy costs um, 
with cooling. So one of the things we can do is use outside air. Uh, when I was in college, uh, my professor and I were uh, talked about this because here we are running running refrigeration in the middle of winter to dry to cool um, uh, milk from dairy cows when we've got piles of snow outside that we could actually um, melt to uh, uh, get the, the cool out of it or just use the, the fact that it's 10 degrees outside this morning. Uh, we could uh, get some uh, free cooling there. So in a uh, storage facility, one, we can just exchange some air to bring some, some cold air in. And uh, there's some companies out there that have systems out there. So Thermador is, is one that's used on uh, uh, large cooling systems. So we can do this manually. So if you had a small root cellar, you might manually open and close or turn fan on and off to bring in outside air. Or we can have a controller like the modern root cellar that I showed you earlier that basically has some kind of controller. It looks at the temperature, it looks at the time of day, and brings air in when it, when it will help us. Um, one of the disadvantages of bringing outside air in is a loss of humidity because we're exchanging air, we're taking humid air and putting it out if we're bringing air in. And the other is uh, we've got uh, colder air is drier, has holding less humidity. Um, so as we bring that air in, we're going to have to humidify it to maintain our temperature. So I put, these are some more graphs from that the root cellar I showed you earlier. And um, I think this 2002 was the first year they, they had it. But you can see where um, they loaded the uh, um, squash and then started maintaining at 50 degrees. And it comes along here and pr stands pretty warm. And you can see they actually had some temperature rise on this end. Um, they couldn't maintain the temperature because the outside temperature but uh, went up versus a few years later at very stable um, temperatures despite lots of variation in the, the temperature outside. Um, so you know on this end uh, we were at the mercy of the outside air temperature and the fact that we may have the ground temperatures only uh, 50 degrees so uh, we're going to have some warming um, uh, because of the temperature, out, we, we couldn't uh, maintain that temperature. Uh, bulk storage, I just kind of quickly go over bulk storage facilities. Uh, so typically this is used, um, well it can be used potatoes, carrots, squash. There's lots of products that can be bulk stored. So typically we're going to have a, a bulk storage product in a bin. Uh, we're going to have some kind of airflow that's going to come under the product or across it and up through it. Um, when it gets up to the top, uh, it may be refrigerated uh, and it'll be recirculated um, basically back through. It's going to be humidified. So here's an evaporative cooling pad. We may have a centrifugal humidifier in here also. Uh, so when this air is coming back in, it's going to be cold and it's going to be humid. Uh, anytime we're humidifying, we want to do the humidification of the air after the refrigeration. Otherwise, we're, we're going to be uh, dehumidifying the air. Um, the other uh, thing that we need to look at is uh, clearances around the box. So this is uh, looking at, say, we have uh, pallet boxes in a bin. Uh, we've got to leave air places for airflow. So um, we've got our, our evaporator up here. We need to re room so the air can get down to the far end and come down the wall and basically we're pressurizing this so that we hope that some of this air will move back through the product and then back up uh, and through the uh, evaporator again. So typically on the direction of the airflow you want 8 to 10 inches on, on the um, those ends and then about 4 to 6 on the sides here uh, to provide um, flow around the, the product. Uh, so that's just an example of that. Now, if you need um, extra cooling, um, the other thing we might want to do is, is if you've got flat bottom boxes, you might want to put them on pallets so you get airflow under them, uh, say across the floor here. Um, the other is if you need cooling faster, 
is you want to leave space between the, the, the boxes so you get airflow all the way around. Uh, here's how a plenum wall would work uh, for kind of a long-term storage. So we'd have our boxes in here. We've got uh, a wall over on this end, and we've got some holes in here where the air can move through. Um, so where the air is going to come into the wall, it's going to go go through. So we've, we're going to use a box, uh, a pallet box with a two-way fork. So if we look at the, the box itself, um, I don't remember if I have a picture of that in here, but it's going to have solid sides all the way down to the bottom of the pallet. So let's see if I can draw one quick. Um, see my drawing ability here. So here'd be the pallet end where, where we put the forks in, and the sides are solid all the way to the bottom. So when we, we uh, stack this, we've got an, uh, basically an air duct in here by the pallets being aligned. So that becomes airflow. And then we have slotted bottoms uh, to allow the air to come up and go down through the pr through the product. And then the the every other one every other uh, stack of pallets provides an air duct out uh, to provide that that uh, loop for the cooling. So that's how we use. And here again, humidification needs to be in the uh, in the plenum after refrigeration. So what kind of what do we do for material handling? Typically, we want to use bins, and the bigger the bin, the more labor efficient this is typically going to be. Uh, so we can use wood, or we can use plastic. Uh, wood has the advantage of probably being a little more repairable. You can make them yourself. Uh, there's not a big secret in that. Uh, the disadvantage is they're harder to sanitize, and uh, they absorb moisture, and they can carry um, storage diseases from year to year is another disadvantage. Um, plastic ones, um, they need to be FDA approved plastic for food grade. Um, they're easy to sanitize, sanitize and some of them are repairable. Uh, you have to send them back to the manufacturer and they can actually uh, plastic weld the, the crack, say, uh, up to repair them. Um, when we're selecting a pallet or a bin, we need to make sure it's rated for the load. So if we know in a bin we can get 800 pounds of carrots, we need to make sure that that bin is rated for 800 pounds or higher. If it's rated for 600, it's not going to last. The other is that some pallets are only stackable with a lid. So we need to make sure that we understand that, to, that uh, whether they require a lid or not for stacking. Um, lids can be an advantage if we're trying to create that microclimate, uh, so that may be an advantage versus using a plastic bag, uh, but we need to, to understand that. Ideally, we're going to have vented bottoms at least versus and, um, and possibly solid sides. It depends on what we're trying to do. Um, it never hurts to have vented uh, sides. And basically, we're looking at, especially in the bottom, we want about 10% opening in the bottom to get airflow through there. Uh, the advantage of these, they can be handled with a fork truck or, or a pallet jack. Well, pallet jack for big bins, uh, little bins like this, we'd handle them with a, um, a fork truck. And we'd ideally like to standardize on some standardized sizes uh, so that you're not constantly trying to match, mix and match. The other is if you're going to use racking or shelving in a, in a cooler, um, make sure that uh, whatever bins you use fit on the racking so you can get the most number of bins on the racking uh, as possible so you don't waste space. Because that in, internal space in that cooler, that costs you money to create. So you need to use it as, as well as you can. Um, the other thing is, and we'll go through this in a little bit, is to show you that you need to make sure that the pallet, whatever bins you have, fit in the cooler to waste the least amount of space. Um, and I put this picture in here because square bins, rectangular bins, are going to be much more space efficient typically than something like a muck bucket or round, any kind of round bucket. They're great for pulling stuff out of the field, but once you put uh, them into a facility, the round ones are going to 
have much more wasted space because of their their size. Uh, racking, as I mentioned, can be an advantage. So one allows better accessibility, especially if you have small quantities of products. You can put them on a shelf. Uh, you get better ventilation and air movement around them, so they they cool better. And we, from a food from a food safety standpoint, we want to keep stuff off the floor. So if we've got um, Say we have small bins like this. Uh, we should stack them on a pallet in in the bin to keep them off the floor, so we reduce the chance of contamination. Uh, wire rat racks are going to be better than than uh, um, than solid racks from an airflow standpoint, and uh, rolling racks can be an advantage because we can, if we have small quantities of stuff, we can roll them out, um, you know, package what we want on off that rack and roll it back in. Or we could have this roller cart in the aisle so we can fit more into there. But when we need to get something off the shelf, we can pull that roller rack out um, to uh, get better access. Uh, material handling. Um, almost everybody is going to require a pallet jack to move stuff around. Uh, root crops are, are heavy, uh, so that can be an advantage. If we're um, using racking or we're stacking box, we need, we'll need some kind of a pallet way to lift pallets. So uh, this this uh, device here is what we call a pallet stacker uh, or pallet lift. So we can use to stack things up, and these can be either manually um, manually moved. So you you pull them around and and use your use a um, a hand valve to uh, Make them go up and down, or they can be electrically electric hydraulics and pull, or fully electric, and you just steer. Um, they do have the advantage of being able to work in a narrower aisle than a fork truck. Uh, one of the disadvantages they got they often have legs that stick out in front, uh, so sometimes you they, those get in the way of stacking things. Uh, fork trucks are another advantage. Uh, to moving things either from the field or around the shop, around the storage facility. If they're used inside, they should be electric or propane, not diesel or gas. Um, and then we can use a skid steer also with, with pallet forks to move things around. Again, though, they shouldn't be used inside a facility, only outside. Um, the other thing I like to look at is traffic flow and material flow. Um, you know, how do you need need stuff? So one is room to maneuver um, your equipment either around the the packing area or in the cooler. Um, so this this uh, picture here kind of shows how we stack things to get them in the cooler most efficiently. So we've got a door here. We're going to put most of the stuff long ways, but then we're going to put a little bit of stuff sideways, and then the last few bins come in straight in. Um, Basically, so we can maximize the use of that internal space in the cooler. Um, the other issue is whether you want first in, first out, or last in, first out. Um, so a cooler like this with one door is going to be last in, first out. Uh, if we want first in, first out, then we've got to do something down on this end to put another door. Uh, the other is is trying to um, separate pedestrian and vehicle paths. So We've got a door here that's that's uh, being used by fork trucks. We may want to put a passage door uh, someplace else down the wall, so that somebody walking in the door isn't going to co come in meet the fork truck that's whipping around this corner uh, to get the next pallets in. And sometimes, if you're bringing stuff in, you got a stack of pallets in fr in front of you, and you have poor visibility of where you're going and what might be in the way. Um, and the other is to make the storage facility com convenient to the packing or processing area. Uh, I've run into a couple producers where they had coolers that were detached from their processing area or packing area. So they were having to fight the elements during the wintertime or a rainfall during the summertime to get stuff in and out um, because it was detached. So ideally, they're going to be uh, attached to the same facility. I've already gone through some of these rules of thumb, but just to repeat it, uh, basically you could have two and a half to three cubic foot um, of uh, cooler volume per bushel, and that's basically if you tightly pack stuff. 
Um, if you don't, you're going to have much less util spatial utilization than that. And we need room between the sides and the end walls um, to promote uh, good air circulation and overhead so that the air can get across the top and down the following the other wall. So here I want to look at some layout in issues to look at uh, inefficiencies that we run into. So here's an issue where we've got uh, uh, pallet size and and the the uh, we end up with this area of wasted space uh, on this side because the pallet box we chose uh, wasn't matched up to the the um, size of the cooler. Um, so if we'd had either picked a smaller box so we could put three across or a larger box or made the cooler smaller, we'd have um, better utilization. The other problem here is I can't get the last box in because of where the door's at. Um, so I can't get full, full utilization um, because I can't access that last um, spot. Whereas if the um, door was moved over a little bit and the cooler was a little narrower, uh, now I can get full utilization of the inside of that cooler. Um, um, so you got to get it so the last one goes straight in. Um, so that's an that's a little lesson you got. And this is a planning issue. You got to plan these things out ahead, and you got to make sure the guy putting up the cooler understands the door needs to be where the door needs to be, uh, because otherwise you're not going to be able to get that last box of produce in there. Um, the other issue is we can add doors for accessibility. So here's one large cooler. Uh, we put some racking in here for small quantities of stuff, and uh, another door so we can actually access a bulk storage. And this could this aisle could be filled uh, initially so you've had the you know um, first in uh, first out or no first last in first out in this case um, to do that. So there's nothing that says you can't add more doors. So here's an example if I wanted uh, first in first out I'd add add another door um, so I could get the stuff out of the back side instead of uh, to change it from um, last in, first out, to first in, first out. Uh, so there's nothing says we can't have more doors in a cooler. Um, it does, can lead to more air exchange depending on um, how many are open at once, but just an example. Um, here's another example of how I could do it with one door. Um, so I've got some bulk storage. I can bring that in so I can still get the aisles with racking. Um, maybe not quite as efficient because I've got to have room for, for making this corner. Uh, although if the racking is just holding small stuff that I'm hand carrying in and out, it may be less of an issue. But just some examples of the layout uh, and how you might put these together to maximize uh, the space you're, you uh, need. So a lot of this comes down to planning. So planning, what are my space requirements? What's the material flow? Um, do I have access to the processing area? Uh, how am I going to do my ter material handling? And uh, you know, what are my utility needs? Do I need water, electricity, drains? What temperatures do I need? Uh, labor and room for future expansion. Uh, I've run into a couple producers already that that they built new facilities, and all of a sudden, three or four or five years down the line, um, they were very successful. And they need to add. Uh, cooler space, but they didn't plan ahead, so they don't have a good location to add that cooler space, and then then it creates inefficiencies because they had to go out someplace else. Whereas if they plan that up front to double their their size or triple their size of the cooler space and and the associated packing and processing area, um, they'd be be able to maintain that that labor efficiency. Um, uh, throughout their the life of their uh, business, so and then you know some other things. So you know we've got the packing area. We we've got to clean stuff as it comes in out of the field. Uh, we've got to get the produce from the field. We've got storage. We may need some employee space. We may need an office space. Um, so different things to to look at. The other thing I like to do is do flowcharts by crop, so I know what my needs are. So. 
you know, it's coming from the field. Is it getting washed or is it getting packed into bulk bins and going directly into storage? Uh, when it comes out of storage, um, is it being sorted? Um, what am I doing with my calls? How am I handling uh, the calls? Is it going to compost? Is it going to processing? Um, maybe you donate some to a food bank. Um, I might need some short-term storage, so after I've packaged it before it goes to market, I may need some short-term storage. So that may be in the long-term storage building or cooler, but you know, at least so I know where that's going, what the path is, and then how's it getting to market. Uh, people come in to pick it up, or do I need a truck to take that to market? So if I do this for each crop, this basically, if you write it out as well, what the steps are, you know, you can extend this actually all the way to planting, planting, um, so that you know what machine do I use to plant, what plates do I need, uh, or or other materials, um, when's the typical harvest date, what equipment you're going to harvest it with, what weed control you're going to do, how you're going to do it. So, you know, kind of writing out that, that process flow chart so that you might be able to take that and hand it to an employee and say, this is a step I want you to do today. Here's where you go find the equipment. The other is the building layout. Um, so here's an example of a building layout. So I've got my, uh, I got a ramp coming into the field so I can bring stuff in. I got some washers and coolers in here. Um, I got my coolers all in one end of end of the the uh, facility. I've got a loading dock out. Um, so you know my material coming in come through the belt conveyor right into the cooler. They can come out of the cooler and go through the sorting line, packing line. It can go back into a cooler, and then it can go uh, out to market. So trying to think of how those would go. And then the other thing is where the people path is within this. Um, you know, in some cases, it's going to be the same work alleys. In some cases, you might be able to sort them out and, and make them in different spaces. So planning ahead. So what are some economic factors that we need to consider? One is there's a cost to build and operate a storage facility. You know, if you already have one for summer storage, um, you may be able to adapt that to winter storage. Um, but if you're starting from scratch, um, you may need to, to look at how you're going to manage that. Do you have the facilities to move, wash, and pack heavy, bulky materials? You know, things like rutabagas, turnips, potatoes, carrots, they're all heavy materials and bulky. Um, so being able to handle that by a pallet box versus a, a tote box is going to be a big advantage from a labor saving standpoint. What are you going to expect for shrink shrinkage uh, coming out of storage? Um, you're always going to have some losses. Uh, what are those typical losses going to be? Because I need to factor it into my costs. Labor costs so and benefits. So there could be some labor costs because I'm going to put a product into storage and bring it out versus maybe selling it directly, like, directly from the field. It could allow you to keep a valued employee through the winter. Um, or it could allow you to work through the winter without having to go get a part-time job. So there can be some advantages that way. What are the markets? Are there markets and what is the pricing um, that I need? Because typically I'm going to need to get a little higher pricing uh, for winter stored pro products because I'm storing it longer um, than something I've only stored for a few days uh, before it heads to market. And then what are the risks or reward? You know, I've got that product in storage, but if it spoils uh, because the electricity went out, that's a risk. So how am I going to protect myself from that? Or, um, you know, is it worth the risk to, to do this versus basically selling it at harvest? Uh, capital costs. So there is a cost to this. And in many cases, you're going to need more than one cooler. So you need to plan out how many units you may need, depending on the, the assortment of crops that you have. Um, you know, something like squash or potatoes, you may not need a cooler, um, but you may need a, a cool room. Um, so a way to, to uh, control that. So here's some ballpark costs. Um, you know, a 12 by 12 cooler um, 
new and used. So these are uh, with refrigeration. Uh, so eight to nine thousand new for you know basically about half price used, and the same with a a, a larger cooler. So just to give you you know ballpark figure on uh, what you might find for uh, the cost of a cooler depending on your needs. And then uh, there's pricing and cost. How do I how do I look at it? So I've mentioned there's higher cost because of of um, of uh, different factors. So Growers, at least uh, Anadoli, have estimated about 20% more in costs um, because of handling and shrinkage and sorting and, and stuff. Um, so you've got to factor those those in when you're figuring out what you're going to charge for your product. Um, you know, at um, one advantage of winter markets is that uh, you may achieve a, a positive cash flow in a time of year that usually you don't have any or very low cash flow. So that can be an advantage. The other is you could have some utility costs to run this cooler. Uh, typically, two to four dollars a day, although th that's going to vary greatly on the size of the cooler, what temperatures you're doing using at. If you're cooling it or you're storing a product through the winter, um, you're going to need supplemental heat in that cooler. And people laugh when I say, "But this is a cooler, not a heater." If it's outside, if it's outside in a cold space, now if it's inside a heated building, you're not going to need that. But if it's outside in in a unheated area or or in an unheated building, where it's going to be ambient temperature around that cooler, having a heater is an insurance policy. Um, one of my uh, co-authors on this project or collaborators uh, lost a cooler full of carrots because he did have a heater in it, wasn't wasn't big enough. Uh, during a cold spell, um, so you you are going to need some heating in that cool, cooler, or at least the ability to do some heat in that cooler uh, during very cold, uh, prolonged episodes. And it depends where you are. If you're say in Kansas, you may not need it. If you're in Wisconsin, you're going to need a heater. Uh, so that's a, a kind of that's one of those risk risk things. Uh, here's a, we've got a developed a, a basically a tool to estimate energy costs so here's an energy cost estimator for uh, and this has um, lots of of, uh, of uh, assumptions in it um, but basically we're looking at about six hundred dollars to run this cooler this 12 by 12 by 9 cooler um, for a year and I think this is based on 10 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour Uh, shrinkage and labor costs. Um, basically, uh, uh, we canvassed some growers, and they for squash and onions, it was about 30, 20 to 30 percent spoilage. Root crops is basically three to 10 percent. Um, basically, culls in most cases, and cabbage is basically 10 to 40 percent, and it's basically stored diseases. So, different crops have different challenges in in handling that and the amount of <clears throat> loss you're going to have um, from that. And the labor d can depend on, you know, from a few hours a week to an owner operator where you don't have hired uh, to, uh, you know, part-time, full-time help for a larger operation. So it's just going to depend on the size of your operation as to what your labor requirements are going to be. This uh, table kind of tries to show you some, from uh, four different farms kind of uh, some examples. So we've got a small farm as A going up to a large farm uh, for D. Uh, so we had you know, 800 square foot up to 22,000 square foot in cooler space. And um, we went from uh, a CSA to a direct market and wholesale. Um, and some of the things is, is we try to put a number on this. So we've got gross margin per, per cubic foot of of cooler space. Um, so this depends on, you know, the type of product, the value of the product you're putting in the cooler as to what this would be. But just to kind of give you a ballpark, uh, there's an updated version of this in the publication uh, where we actually have a different metric on, on this as well. So just trying to get you some way to, to look at uh, 
uh, the value of that, that space. There are some programs out there to, uh, through, there is a program out there through Farm Service Agency uh, to uh, provide some loan and loan guarantees for um, uh, cooler storage. Originally when this came out, it was just for commodity crops like corn and soybeans, and then uh, cold storage for on-farm got added to it. Um, so um, the rates vary. I've got uh, the last time I checked what these rates were, uh, but it varies. Um, it's up to $500,000. you got to put 15% down. It's only for new storage. It's not for used. Um, and it basically has to be a, a framed structure or permanently or prefab permanently installed structure. Uh, it's not for mobile operations. That's got to have a useful life of 15 years. So you go to your local farm service agency to find out more uh, about this. So uh, summary, we need to know the, the storage requirements of the crop in order to, to um, provide the environment they need to, to uh, last the longest and, and maintain their marketability. We need to market the products within the expected uh, storage life of that product. Uh, trying to push something beyond the envelope could end up with, with a total loss because of spoilage. Uh, we need to plan storage facilities uh, to, to understand the workflow and traffic flow patterns. We need to use foam insulation. Uh, if you're building something, say you're converting a building or building your own, it needs to be foam insulation in the walls, all of it, not just some of it. Uh, the, and if you take a building, strip it back through the walls, get all the, the uh, fiberglass or blown-in insulation out uh, because that will absorb moisture because we're dealing with a high moisture environment here and you're going to have moisture getting into that wall. Plan for expansion. All ex successful operations um, basically, eventually they need to expand. Um, so plan for it up front, how you'd handle it, or what your, what your plans are if you're ex really successful, so that you don't uh, uh, design in inefficiencies in the future because you fail to plan up front. Sanitize containers and the storage facilities between seasons. So that can be either from summer to fall or from uh, year to year. Uh, storage diseases and insects can can be in that in on the containers or in that storage facility, and um, we need to try to reduce that so you reduce your your risk of storage diseases. And price the crop to cover your additional costs. Um, you know, storage isn't free, um, so unless you're you're making very high markups on your summer crops you're probably going to want to charge a little more for your winter crops. And typically, there's less competition in the winter time, so it does allow you to uh, charge a little more. So we do have a new publication coming out, um, and it'll be uh, online at the learning store, uh, uwex.edu. And if you search for publication A4105, uh, you should find it. So for 84 page a bulletin that covers uh, the, the planning, design, and operation of coolers for uh, storage of uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, here are some other uh, resources that uh, we found over the years. The first one is out of date, and that's my, this new publication kind of uh, replaces that, but that's one you can find that you might find on Amazon uh, or on Google. Um, uh, here's another one that has some storage conditions in it for storing fruits and crops. One of the best um, resources for different crops and their storage conditions is this USDA ARS site called the Agricultural Handbook number 66. It's online and you can get all kinds of information from, from that. And there's some other publications here that uh, you may find, find useful. So with that, we're going to conclude. Uh, if you have questions, because this was a uh, webinar-based, uh, you can email them or uh, call me, and we'd be glad to discuss or try to answer your questions. With that, we'll conclude. Thank you.